is the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. West Welcome to Wise Guys. These guys know sports on this Monday, September the 14th. Another day on the Wise Guys show on the Worldwide Sports Network with my co-host, Mr. Clarence Nixon. What's up, Clarence? Hey, what's up, Trey? Happy Monday, brother. How you doing today? Happy Monday, brother. Hey, I got something for you, everybody. If you won and all on the season, clap your hands. See, my Packers got that dub yesterday against them Vikings. Hey, I saw it. You got that Beagles cup in your hand, man. This ain't the day to be raising that up, drinking that, because y'all owe one on the season to start the year off, Mr. Nixon. Yeah, but I was proud of my team, though. They fought hard, and I ain't about to get into that kick, bro. Don't even get me started on it. We're going to get into that kick. We're going to get into much more on the Chargers beating the Bengals 16 to 13 Sunday afternoon at Paul Brown Stadium yesterday. But first, before we do that, Everybody, remember, go and follow Wise Guys on Twitter at WiseGuys underscore H. Also on Facebook, Wise Guys. And be sure to follow Wise Guys on Instagram at These Guys Know Sports. we got a ton of NFL action we'll get into today with our viewers. Again, we're going to talk about the hometown Bengals losing to the Chargers 16-13. Also, later on the show, give us y'all votes right now on the live while we're talking. Who is the NFL Comeback Player of the Year? you got four choices. Big Ben, Cam Newton, Rob Gronkowski, and who am I missing? Am I missing one? Who am I missing? AJ Green. AJ Green. Yeah, AJ Green. That's right. We got four. AJ, Big Ben, you know, Cam Newton, and Rob Gronkowski. Give us y'all selection for who's going to win NFL Comeback Player of the Year this year. Clarence, I'm going to give you the floor to start off this first topic. Well, because we know it's about my boys. Go oh, ahead, bro. You got the floor. Now, now, now I, I did want to ask you, though. So is you asking me the question of how was I impressed or am I No, no, no. You got you got you got the first one. You got the first you got the first question. Go ahead and break it down and open up for us. The first question of the day. Go ahead. You got it. Yeah. So, you know your 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 uh Green Bay Packers defeated the Minnesota Vikings 43 to 34, where Aaron Rodgers was 32 of 44, oh, 364 pass yard, four touchdowns, Aaron Jones, 16 carries, 66. 66 rushing yards and a touchdown. And I can't forget about Devontae Adams had 14 catches, 156 yards, and two touchdowns. Trey, you know it's week one. How impressive you is with this Green Bay Packers victory over the Minnesota Vikings. Well, I was very impressed with my Packers yesterday and that domination performance they put on display on the Minnesota Vikings. And they proved why they are the team to beat in the NFC North Clarence. Last year, you know we finished 13-3 and on the season. We beat Minnesota both games last year in the division, and we are the team to beat in the NFC North. And my Green Bay Packers and Aaron Rodgers showed just that yesterday. Yesterday, the Packers offense had 522 total yards. We had 31 first downs. We had 17 passing first downs, 11 rushing first downs, Nice balance between Aaron Rodgers and Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams. So the Packers offense played at an elite level yesterday in week one, Clarence. Something we didn't see last year when Aaron Rodgers was in his first season under Matt LaFleur. I thought that yesterday in the first quarter, Aaron Rodgers and that Packers offense was very pedestrian. They they, they wasn't really putting up any statistical numbers very much. They kind of were struggling in that first quarter. But from the second quarter on yesterday, once the Packers got into a rhythm yesterday, the game was over. Aaron Rodgers showed why he still is a top five quarterback in the NFL. Yesterday, Aaron Rodgers goes 32 of 44 for 364 passing yards clearance Mm -hmm. and four touchdowns. Yesterday, I know Lamar Jackson 
dominated the Cleveland Browns. I know Russell Wilson only had like four or five com- incompletions against the Atlanta Falcons, but Aaron Rodgers was the performer of the day. He had the best performance of all the rest of the NFL quarterbacks. And all I heard all off season was how Aaron Rodgers is past his prime. I heard that from you too. So I'm going to call you out tonight on Wise Guys. So many people try to play my quarterback and pretend as if Aaron Rodgers was over the hill. Aaron Rodgers doesn't have anything left in the tank. The Packers are drafting his replacement. Therefore, Aaron Rodgers' days are numbered in Green Bay. And all Aaron Rodgers did yesterday when he showed up to MetLife Stadium. I believe it's MetLife Stadium. That's what the Vikings call their stadium. No, I US, can't remember that. U.S. Bank. U.S. US Bank. Bank, that's right. I'm thinking about the Giants Stadium, I believe. U.S. Bank Stadium yesterday. All he did was show up and show why he is still a top five NFL quarterback in the NFL. And I got another one better for you. He showed that the only quarterback you can definitively say is better than him is Patrick Mahomes. There were throws in that game yesterday, Clarence, that only Aaron Rodgers and Patrick Mahomes can make. Not Tom Brady, although Tom Brady is the GOAT. He's the most accomplished quarterback in NFL history. We know Deshaun Watson. He has tremendous talent. Lamar Jackson, the reigning NFL MVP. He's a great playmaker, dynamic player as well. They can't make the throws that Aaron Rodgers can make. Patrick Mahomes can, but only them two players can make certain throws. That throw that he made to Marquez Valdez Scanley before the oh, half. Yeah. He dropped it in a bucket to Marquez Valdez Scanley. Yeah. Then that throw that he had to Devontae Adams, that pretty much sealed the deal for us in that game. Yeah. In the second, I think it was in the second quarter. He had a throw to Devontae for that touchdown pass right up the sideline that only Aaron Rodgers can make. Listen, I heard all the doubters all season long. Don't you think for one second Aaron didn't hear him either? He's motivated this year, Clarence. And I'm going to tell you one more thing before I let you have the floor. Aaron Rodgers is now in a system that he has learned. He had a whole season last year, and he only had 26 touchdowns and four interceptions last year, which wasn't bad. So he learned that system. Now he knows the system. Therefore, I believe Aaron Rodgers has a legitimate chance to win NFL MVP this year. If Aaron Rodgers is in the MVP conversation, y'all better look out the rest of the NFL because the Packers will be Super Bowl contenders. Because we always talk about the Ravens. We always talk about the Chiefs in the AFC. In the NFC, we're talking about the Saints, the Bucks. You better include my Green Bay Packers in that conversation if Aaron Rodgers finds himself in, in the NFL MVP conversation. You have the floor. Look, first of all, that was a good take. I'm so happy football is back, though, Trey, man, because you're excited, you're smiling, you're energetic, and I'm, 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 I'm thriving off the energy. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I'm, you, you, I'm thriving out. Oh, my bad. Yeah. My bad thing. Oh. Real quick, because I want to say this too. Yesterday. Okay, my bad. We always, my bad. Everybody now, was talking about you okay? Admit, you okay? That was the first game that I watched yesterday. And Aaron Rodgers was phenomenal. He was phenomenal in the game that he he picked out. He, he basically tortured this, the disadvantage in the secondary of the Minnesota Vikings. And I was very impressed with Devontae Adams' play yesterday because every throw that was thrown to him, he was automatic catching it, and he was leading this Steven group. And regardless of Michael Vallis standing, he was performing too. He, what, six catches with 98 yards? Yeah. That right there, right there, that was very, that was very, like, like impressive because last season he was he was listed as the worst receiver on the team. So that proved that that gave him motivation to prove for this season that hey, Aaron Rodgers definitely has weapons on this team. And for Aaron Jones, I it, well, he put up the best numbers, but he put up good serviceable numbers that you will want from him. And I think I think with him running the ball, it makes this team balanced though because Aaron Rodgers. He's going to get everything good out of Aaron Rodgers. You see what we did. He tortured this Vikings defense. He, he converted every third down. Every third down he was on. He, he made that throw. I'm like, wow. And then it gave, and then you have to think, and, and inside the game, though, like you thought uh, Minnesota was building momentum, but Aaron Rodgers just striked it away. Third, maybe third and eight, whatever. He got the first down. He was just pure dominant. He didn't throw no intercepts, interceptions, though. You know, that's rare they be throwing a lot of interceptions or an interception in a season opener. But Aaron, Aaron Rodgers definitely dominated this game, though, on the road. And 
for the Minnesota Vikings, if you want to compete in the NFC North, you have to win games like this. And you have to beat a team like the Green Bay Packers. But I was very impressed with Joe Packers, though, Trey, because they came in, met, they came in U.S. Bank Arena and took care of business. They definitely did. And yesterday, Aaron Rodgers wasn't the only player that showed why he should be recognized as a top five player at his position. Devontae Adams, you mentioned him, our number one receiver. He had 14 receptions, 156 receiving yards, two touchdowns on the afternoon. That Viking secondary had no answers for Devontae Adams. And let me say this. Devontae Adams is the best route runner we have in the NFL. I love Tyreek Hill and his speed. He's a great, great speedster on the outside for the Chiefs. I love Odell Beckham and his breakaway speed. Like, he has great breakaway speed. I love yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Julio Jones and how he can catch the ball in traffic. But Devontae Adams is the best route runner in the NFL. Just talking about pure route running. Devontae Adams is the best that we have in the NFL. But you brought it up. Yesterday, we had some quality production out of our second and third receivers in yeah. NBS. MVS yesterday, Marquez Valdez Scantling, he had four receptions, 96 yards, one touchdown. And MVS actually dropped a few passes, Clarence, that were potential touchdowns. If he would have caught the damn ball, Aaron Rodgers might have had five or six touchdowns. Allen Lazard, he had four receptions, 63 receiving yards, one touchdown. I'm going to tell you something right now. If MVS and Allen Lazard emerge as nice quality receivers behind Devontae Adams, the rest of the NFL better watch out. They better watch out yeah. because Aaron has learned this system. We know Aaron Jones is the kind of running back that can flourish in a Matt LaFleur system because he did it last year. And Aaron Jones also can catch the ball out of the backfield. He create mismatches for opposing teams, linebackers. You can't guard Aaron Jones in open field. And now you add in MVS and Alan Lazard to this receiving core with Devontae Adams and they give you quality production at some point. If, if they ain't producing, you can't double Devontae Adams no more. You got to bring that other safety on the other side over. You can't, du you can't double Devontae Adams no more. So that means everyone across the board will have one-on-one -on -one coverage, which means Aaron Rodgers, who's one of, the, of two players in the NFL who can put the ball where only his receiver can catch it, that is trouble for the rest of the NFL and the rest of the NFL's opposing defenses because my Packers offense will be virtually unstoppable. So let me ask you this, though. You know, Aaron Rodgers has been dealing with a lot of uh, media critics saying that he has a, a two-year window in Green Bay. Jordan Love, he's preparing to help Jordan Love mentor. And actually, Jordan Love wasn't even in uniform today. He was in street clothes. He was in street clothes. Like, they didn't need him today. They didn't, and Aaron Rodgers got injured today. Jordan Love, they, he wasn't even going to be available. But I want to ask you this, though, Trey. How impressive, how impressive you is with Aaron Rodgers' individual, like, performance. Oh, is that his performance was the best performance of the day. Best performance of the day. 32 of 44 passing, 364 yards, four touchdowns. It was a dominating performance by Aaron Rodgers. And, again, he showed why he should be recognized in that top five quarterback in the NFL conversation. Like I said, he's heard all the doubters like me all year long. All offseason long, all I heard is Aaron Rodgers washed up. Aaron Rodgers doesn't have anything left in the tank. Aaron Rodgers is going to get replaced by Jordan Love in the next two years. You just said it. Jordan Love didn't even play yesterday. He was in street clothes. That's what make his, that's what make the pick so baffling. That's what make me irritated with the Packers organization even more. General Manager Brian Gutekus, you drafted Jordan Love in the first round, traded up to get Jordan Love, knowing good and damn well that the Packers needed more weapons offensively for Aaron Rodgers. We were one win away from the Super Bowl. What are you doing, Brian? What are you doing, Matt? You draft Aaron Rodgers another target so Aaron can not only have Devontae Adams on one side, he can have a reliable second option at the receiver spot. But again, if MVS and Alan Lazard step up this year and they ball out the Packers organization actually the decision to pick Jordan Love won't look as bad because what you're basically saying is we believe in Alan Lazard we believe in Marquez Valdez yeah. that's what you're basically saying so if, if they pan out this year and have good seasons then that means the pick of Jordan Love doesn't seem so bad 
in the grand scheme of things. But like I said, man, Aaron Rodgers balled out yesterday. Okay. He had a great Aaron Rodgers performance. And last year, because Aaron Jones played so well, most people, even including myself to some degree, felt like this was going to be an Aaron Jones-led team this year. And Aaron Rodgers yesterday, all he did was say, hold my beer. Hold my beer. <laughs> this is still my team. We still have our success based around what I do in football games. And that's all that happened. Oh, and I ain't going to lie. <laughs> it, 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 it did turn into that situation. Hey, man, hold my beer real quick because I'm about to show these kids, like, who the real top player is. But I, I look at it as this. If Aaron Rodgers keep continue playing like he did yesterday against the Minnesota Vikings, that pick with Jordan Love, it certainly would be a safe pick. I consider it as a safe pick because you know Aaron Rodgers, again, up in the age, not saying father time is coming towards him, but if in order for you, when you when you get when a new coach can get into town, he needs to get his quarterback, his own personal quarterback. And regardless, he has a Hall of Fame quarterback in front of him, he needs to be on the safe side to get his own quarterback. And I think, and I look at it as that. If Aaron Rodgers keep continuing to dominate in, into this NFL season, Jordan Love will be considered as a safe pick. And you can make that argument as, well, we really needed, we really wanted to draft a receiver, but we took a risk on our, our undrafted receiver because we see some potential in them and we can see how they can play, pay off. So that right here, it's like a hit or miss. So Jordan Love, that right there is like, Low risk, high reward, that type of situation. But I'm excited that every all these uh, undrafted receivers came alive with Aaron Rodgers, and you see they've been working hard in the offseason because it's their time. Believe it or not, though, Trey. Hey, if you ain't if your team ain't drafting a receiver, they got confident in you. They got a lot of confidence in you, like Al Lazard, MVS, them type of guys, and Quentin and St. Brown. They they basically you brought as a guest. He's building confidence in you. Like, you, you guys are the next big thing. We need somebody to go step up behind Devontae Adams. And if I had to pick that, I like Alan Lazard because he's more flexible and more versatile. I like him. I like him as the number two, the legit number two. But MPS, he did a dominant good job. He, he, he's, he's great. He top air speed. And I think he's going to pan out just fine if and they help Aaron Rodgers dominate. For this season, but this season right here for Green Bay is very tough. And I'm looking through the schedule right now. I see that you, I know you got week eight targeted against San Francisco. So that right there. And wait, matter of fact, next week is a Sunday night game against the Saints, right? Yeah, next week three. Week three. Week three. We got the deep break. So yeah, next right week, there, week three. Yeah. I'm, keep, I'm keeping tab. Can Aaron Rodgers play in these big games and can he continue this dominance? But Trey, honestly. I'm I'm very impressed for what Aaron Rodgers did on the field yesterday, and I know you happy because you inboxed me as soon as they won. Yeah, Don't I did. Like, oh, man, I gotta hear this all day on Monday. Yeah. Like, right there, Aaron Rodgers came and dominated. That's something that you can't like discredit, but you get credit when it's due. Devontae Adams, he looked like a top five legit receiver out there. I've been telling you that, but here's the thing too. I want to say. Although our offense was explosive yesterday, putting up 43 points. Defensively, Clarence, we got to do better. Giving up 34 points to the Vikings, even though it was in garbage time. I, right. think our de- I think our defense basically took for granted Aaron Rodgers' great performance. Because they knew Aaron Rodgers was dialed in. I kind of felt like defensively, we let our took our foot off the gas pedal against the Vikings yesterday. I need more out of the Smith brothers. Preston Smith, Darius Smith, they only had one sack yesterday. I need more production from the Smith brothers. I need them applying pressure to oppose the team's quarterbacks and hey. creating turnovers so our offense can put up points Believe and Aaron Rodgers can do what he does. But I know Jair Alexander, who I think is going to emerge as one of the top cornerbacks in the NFL this year. He had, one inter- he had one interception yesterday, Clarence. That was very impressive. But for the most part, Adam Thielen had his way with my Packers secondary yesterday. Adam <laughs> Thielen had six, he had six receptions for 110 receiving yards and two touchdowns. And I like Adam Thielen, but but I believe the Packers got to do a better job in the secondary at containing some of these top receivers in the NFL. And again, the Smith brothers got to do a better job of applying pressure because only one believe sack, is that's not going to cut it. Believe it or not, Adam Thielen is my fantasy receiver. So he gave me 31 points yesterday, and I'm still in the in loop. So... <laughs> 
So, yeah. and you know, this year, this year, Adam Thielen more than likely is going to get more targets because they traded yeah. away Stephon Diggs to the Buffalo Bills. Yeah, definitely. I enjoyed Jefferson yesterday. Justin Jefferson, matter of fact, excuse me. He had only two catches of 27 yards. I think for Kirk Cousins in that situation, you have to get, get him a groove, get him yeah. the feeling of the NFL. Like, but that type of situation, you have to. You you drafted him first. He's a first. He's a first round pick. You have to get him involved. And Dalvin Cook is unacceptable for fifty carries and twelve. Well, what twelve carries for fifty yards? Regardless, he had two touchdowns. But you gotta feed him the ball more. He just got paid, so you gotta utilize him, man. But the thing is, Clarence, the reason why they couldn't utilize Dalvin Cook in the running game was because my Packers was up two scores. So they had to throw the ball and put the ball in Kirk Cousins' hands. Although, yeah. I believe heading into the fourth quarter, Kirk Cousins only had, like, 15 passing attempts at that moment. Like, even though I, I feel like at some point you got to do away with the running game because you see Aaron Rodgers is dialed in. Your defense can't stop Aaron Rodgers. And, again, that Vikings secondary, they lost Xavier Rhodes to free agency, and they got a lot of rookies that they got starting right now in the secondary. And that's part of the reason why I think Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams took advantage of it. But like I said, I think my Packers are the team to beat in the yeah. NFC North, and they showed just that yesterday in week one. You know who the young – okay, before we go to the next topic, you know who the, young, the youngest corner on the Minnesota Vikings is 24 years old. I think his name is Tazir White. His name is White number 24. He is 24 years old, man. He the youngest on that. So they definitely have to develop, man. And they got to beat Green Bay again. But it's going to be in Lambeau. So they will see how they progress, man. Yeah, we definitely will. Let's move on to our second topic of the day and talk about the hometown Cincinnati Bengals, Clarence's favorite team, as we title this segment, the Cincinnati Bengals Blunder. As the Los Angeles Chargers beat the Cincinnati Bengals 16 to 13 yesterday afternoon at Paul Brown Stadium. Tyrod Taylor finished 16 of 30, 208 yards on the afternoon. Joe Burrow went 23 of 36 for 193 yards, one interception. Joe Mixon had 19 carries, 69 yards. And the Bengals missed a potential game time field goal as time expired. So my question for you, Clarence, is what was your biggest takeaway? In the Bengals season opener. Vasectomy. I'm going to say that. That kick right there. You was laughing. I seen it. It was ridiculous. But my biggest takeaway from this game was I love the poise that Burrow had in the, in the last late minutes, though. Like, seven straight completions and the ball placement he was just putting in to these receivers and tight ends hands. It was just so it was so beautiful. And Believe it or not, he had some rookie mistakes. The mistakes that, like, ah, oh, man, Burrow, you didn't, like, it was a, it was the play. When he when he pitched it, trying to pitch it to Geo, and it was an interception, he had A.J. Green open right there. It was a, it was a rookie mistake and a mental, like, ah, oh, you got to, you got to, you got to think more. You got to think, you got to plan B it. But, and Joe, and for Joe Mixon, though, for he had 19 carries, 69 yards, you, you just get, we just know you just got paid. You're the eighth highest paid running back in the NFL, you we need more from you. We need more, we need you to be more aggressive. But who's to say about that offensive line? The offensive line, they gave up three sacks, but most of the sacks came on the right side with Bobby Hart. I was very disappointed, very disappointed that Bobby Hart let let Joey Bosa just have have his day with him. It was barbecue chicken right there, man. And then it was a play right there though when he was just saying, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm the best. I'm the best. Money talk bush walk. I'm like, wow, he, this guy is talking crazy. And for the Chargers side, like Tyrod Taylor, he came in as a game manager, came management quarterback. He came, he did his thing, and he actually led this team. And that defense did a good job in the first half. But for my uh, my Bengals, we adjusted in the second half, but it was some miscues that we need to, like, you know, look over and get better at. But I think overall, I am, I'm happy of Burrow's performance. But I'm disappointed that Fat Randy missed a, a chip shot, a missed a chip shot of a 33 yarder. And then listen, there's an injury report that he got a leg cramp in his left leg. The man was holding his right tray. I'm I'm pissed. I'm, I am I am I am upset because for the simple fact that he caught a Charlie horse on the tent, but he was holding the wrong leg. Yeah. But it's on, yeah. it's, on to, it's on to the next game, like on Thursday with the Cleveland Browns. And I think for Joe Burrow that this is another test for him. On the road in a divisional matchup, 
five hours away. This is a battle Ohio. So I think he got to get prepared in a short week. And I think it's going to test his mental. But he's poised to lead this team. But big credit for the uh, L.A. Chargers because they brought a lot of blitz. They blitzed them and they made, fun, made mix and fumble. That was ridiculous. But big shout out to them. We'll see them again next year. But I was impressed with the Bengals' uh, performance, offensive side and defense. Well, <laughs> it's funny, man, that you, you know, that you just expressed yourself and how you felt about the game and your biggest takeaways, Clarence. But for me, honestly, the way the game ended was typically how Bengal games end all the time. You know, your Bengals, they'll make, they'll, they'll make the plays, you know, from the, from the first, for the first three quarters and mostly in the fourth quarter, they make the plays necessary to win. But at the most inopportune time, the Cincinnati Bengals will do Cincinnati Bengals type things. That Randy Bullock missed field goal at the end of the first, uh, fourth quarter was typical Cincinnati Bengals things that happen. Stop you it, know that when something can go wrong, it will go wrong. You know, you know how on ESPN first take, my man Stephen A. Smith, who is a part of ESPN and he's one of the sports commentators on their network. You know how the Dallas Cowboys are his team that he says is an accident waiting to happen? The Cincinnati Bengals are my accident waiting to happen. Every single time, you Bengal fans always have a chance and you think that we might win this game, something goes wrong. It always happens, Clarence, and it happened yesterday at Paul Brown Stadium when Randy Bullock completely shanked that kick. It was a complete shank. Like, it, it didn't have a chance to go in. It made no sense. But, again, I wasn't surprised because I knew at some point something is going to get messed up while the Bengals are trying to either win this game or tie this game to go in overtime and then happen on that field goal attempt. But my biggest takeaway first was the Bengals must win the turnover battle if they're going to win football games. Last, last Yesterday, they had two bad turnovers by both Joes. Joe Mixon had a fumble earlier in the game. That's something that he cannot do. Like, you playing with a rookie quarterback in Joe Burrow, you can't turn the football over if you want to have a chance at winning football games. This is a Bengals team that is trying to build the culture up, and they're trying to, you know, put themselves in positions to win games again and compete in the AFC North. If you want to win games, you're not going to win many games if you're losing the turnover battle. The Chargers had no turnovers yesterday, and the Bengals had two turnovers by two important pieces on their offensive side of the ball. Joe Mixon had a fumble, and Joe Burrow, you mentioned it, had a bad interception late in the fourth quarter. I don't know what Joe was doing, but that was a, mis a mistake that cannot happen when you're trying to win games. Like, he has to understand he's not in college anymore. You are playing in the NFL, and any mistakes that you make, the defense will capitalize on it, and the opposing team will win football games because you have to protect the football if you want to win games. So that was one of my takeaways. My second takeaway was I didn't like Zach Taylor's decision to kick the field goal with seven seconds left in the game. I thought he should have gave Joe Burrow one more opportunity to throw the ball in the end zone and possibly win the game. I didn't like the fact that with seven seconds, he's bringing out his field goal unit. Like, as almost as to say he don't trust Joe Burrow in that situation. You're the Cincinnati Bengals. You're not a Super Bowl contender. You're not a playoff contender in my ass. You have nothing to lose. You might as well go for the win, Zach. I don't know what he was doing. But also, you mentioned it. This is my other takeaway. I think Joe Mixon only had like 69 rushing yards. He yeah. need, they, the Bengals need more production out of Joe Mixon. They just paid him that money this offseason. They need more production from their best offensive weapon on the field. They need Joe Mixon to produce at a high level for Joe Burrow to be successful. If, if Joe Mixon is not successful and he's turned the ball over, Joe Burrow is going to struggle. So I need more out of Joe Mixon, and I think that was one of the reasons why the Bengals lost the game. They lost the turnover battle, and again, Joe Mixon's bad production contributed to the loss as well. So those are my three takeaways from the game. I think Zach Taylor, next time he's in that position, he needs to let Joe Burrow try to win the game for the Bengals. Do not hold Joe Burrow back. Let him try to win the game for your team because he puts you in position to possibly win the game. That last drive was a great drive by Joe Burrow. Yes, he asked, I'm going to tell you this right now. Our next question is, how would you grade Joe Burrow's performance, A to F? 
Let me start on this one, Clarence. I'm okay. asking, you might be surprised. You might be surprised here. Given the circumstances and given the fact that we didn't have a training camp, we didn't have preseason games. I actually thought Joe Burrow looked pretty good yesterday. I would get I would give him a B performance yesterday, like a B minus, considering the circumstances. And like I said, he had 193 passing yards, and he went what 23 of 36 passing wise. I thought he played pretty well. He was poised for the most part, although he did get sacked three times. He was poised. And that last drive, he did not fluster. Like, he didn't get flustered. He was just calm. He led the Bengals down in field goal range to win the game. They didn't lose the game because of Joe Burrow. They lost the game because Zach Taylor was reluctant to take some, you know, take some of the, 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 the wheels off and let Joe Burrow just play. But overall, I thought Joe Burrow actually played pretty well given the circumstances and and I, i'm not ready to like i said i never said joe burrow was going to be trash i just said i don't you need to pump the brakes on the whole he's going to be our first ballot hall of famer that's why i'm not going to go that far i'm not ready to say that yet but he did play well yesterday given the circumstances and, and like what you said with zach taylor that play call was crucial that was a crucial play call and i was thinking to myself you have seven seconds. That's enough time to get a get a throw off. It actually takes two seconds to get a throw off in the NFL. Like you, three seconds right there is a long time throwing the ball. But you had seven seconds to get an extra playoff. And I think Burrow, he was so confident into that drive. And Zach Taylor already gave him the, the confidence by burning all the timeouts. Like, hey, I know my quarterback is going to bring bring me bring us to victory. And he did. He led us there. He led us there thinking, oh, yeah, they might as well let bro run one more play. Let him run one more play and see where, where that goes. Now, I can say this. The controversial, the uh, pass, offensive pass interference was controversial. I think it could go both ways. But the ref made the decision to call the play on A.J. Green. But me personally, I, in my opinion, I just think – that it wasn't, it was, it wasn't a pass interference. I just think it was too much contact from both of each other. And AJ Green has the advantage because he's a tall, slim re receiver, and it, it makes it look like he pushed off because he got long arms as he is, and he's trying to find separation because the corner is holding on to him. Casey Herbert holds on to him from all might. Yes. That play right there, what right there, it was, it was money. Burrow, Burrow ball placement, and AJ's Green this. Focus on catching the ball right there, right there was impressive right there, but unfortunately a bad call from pass interference stopped it. And unfortunately, we tried to take the field goal, but Fat Randy missed it. But I was impressed from Burrow's performance. If I had to grade him, what grade I would give him, I get I give him a B, a straight a, a, a B minus. I agree with you, a B minus because the first half, he he, he was he wasn't getting into himself. Second half, he turned it back up. The offensive line started playing better. You know, he got more comfortable. I think he's yeah. getting more comfortable each and every day he's on that football field. And like you said, we didn't have no preseason game, basically no training camps. And for a rookie to come out here and have that type of performance, yeah, I think that's that's impressive. But that Joe Burrow is definitely on my radar. He's on all, he's on the wise guys' radar because I did praise him for so much. So we go keep him on the radar and see how far he can go into this season, Trey. Yeah, and then you talked about the offensive pass interference call that was made on AJ Green. To be honest, I think because we don't have fans in the stands right now, I think that the refs are being impacted because there aren't fans in the stands. I think if we had fans in the stands, I don't think the refs make that call yesterday against AJ Green. I don't think they would make it. I think they. I, I know it's. I just think the fact that we don't have fans in the stands right now, I think the, that's that's actually a, impacting whether or not refs make certain calls. I think if we had fans in the stands yesterday, I believe they don't make that call on AJ Green. You can't. It's a bang bang play, but. Joe Burrow made the right, right read. And it's another thing I want to give Joe Burrow credit for. A lot of times with rookie quarterbacks, what we see is, especially in the first beginning stages of their development, what we see is pre-snap, they always choose a receiver that they're going to throw the ball to. Just like you play Madden. When I play Madden, a lot of times, like, I'll, I'll pick a receiver before I even run my play and say, I'm going to throw it to this person. I'm going to throw it to X. I'm going to throw it to O. A lot of rookie quarterbacks do the same thing. But yesterday, 
Joe Burrow didn't do that. Joe Burrow actually went through his progressions and threw the ball to the open receiver. He didn't just choose one receiver and just threw the ball to that specific receiver that he chose. I thought he did a great job yesterday at going through his progressions, something most rookie quarterbacks always do. Also, he did he did overthrow A.J. Green on the earlier touchdown earlier in the game. That was a touchdown. Yeah, that was a touchdown. He, over, he overthrew A.J. Green on that play. But again, for the most part, I thought, given the circumstances, I thought Joe Burrow played pretty well overall. But one more thing I want to say, too. I think that the Chargers, you know, moving forward, you know, they are a team that if they run the football effectively, they can win some games. I don't think they're going to necessarily make the playoffs because they go in a division with the Kansas City Chiefs, the reigning Super Bowl champions. But I think Tyrod Taylor can manage the Chargers very well offensively, and I think they can win maybe six or seven games and finish seven and nine, eight and eight, and possibly make the playoffs if they steal a game here or there. Because yesterday, you can make a legitimate argument, the Bengals should have won that game, and the Chargers had that 10-0 run in the fourth quarter. But again, I give a lot of credit to Joe Burrow and uh and 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 that that Bengals you know offense on that last drive because he was poised he was calm and he led that team down like a veteran quarterback he I couldn't tell that he was a rookie on that last drive. Yeah, I ain't gonna lie, but now what you said about the LA Chargers, that division right there is very sneaky and tricky at the same time because you've seen the Las Vegas Raiders, the new the Las Vegas Raiders, they went into Carolina and beat Teddy Bridgewater, the Carolina Panthers, in their home with Chris McCaffrey. That shows you points right there that the Raiders team are a brand new team. They're 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 fighting, and and can't you forget about the Denver Broncos? They play t- later on after after tonight at 10:15 against the Tennessee Titans. That's a test for them too. Uh, can they slow down a big running back like Derrick Henry? For the Chargers, I think they're in the position, like you said, if they run the ball really well. They and they get some key stops. They can win some football games. They can really yeah, they win can. some football games. They can't because the, I actually think defensively they have a nice team. And that's another thing I was gonna say. I thought Joe Burrow did a great job considering he was going up against elite cornerback play. The Chargers have nice cornerbacks. They got great secondary, yeah. like hey, Casey Hayward Jr., Desmond King. They got some nice cornerbacks on the defensive side of the ball. And I thought, given the circumstances, I thought Joe Burrow did a nice job going up against some of that great cornerback play that the Chargers present. But nevertheless, the Bengals 0-1, they play the Browns on Thursday night football. We'll preview that game on Wednesday's show. Everybody remember going to follow Wise Guys on Twitter at WiseGuys underscore H, also on Facebook, Wise Guys. And be sure to follow Wise Guys on Instagram with these guys, no sports. Let's switch sports players and talk about some NBA basketball. Basketball, and baby. The Denver Nuggets have forced a game seven against Ooh. the Clippers. The Nuggets. <laughs> the Nuggets rallied from a 19-point deficit and beat the Clippers 111 to 98 in game six. The Clippers, Paul George had 33 points, shot nine of 21 from the floor, had six rebounds. Kawhi Leonard had 25 points, eight rebounds. For the Nuggets, Jokic had 34 points, 14 rebounds, and Jamal Murray had 21 points. So Clarence, as we open up the show today, should we give the Clippers blame? Or the Nuggets credit? Me personally, I'm giving the Clippers blame, man, because you you are you are one of the best top teams in the Western Conference Finals. You're literally right behind the LA Lakers at this point in this bubble. And Doc Rivers, I, you, you're trying to understand how can how how like how can you have these type of stars, these type of players on your team, and you can close out these these games? in five, five or six games. That just shows you right there that your co- coaching is very questionable right there because Kawhi Leonard had 25 points, Paul George had 33 points. What went wrong on there? But I, I will admit, I will admit, Doc Rivers was very honest about his decision. He said the uh, game five and six, the LA Clippers, the Los Angeles Clippers, they wasn't they sound. They wasn't, they wasn't playing like the Clippers basketball. They wasn't there mentally. They wasn't themselves mentally, and that right there was uh, was honesty from a coach that, that, that a coach like Doc Rivers and Paul George. We've been talking about how he struggles and stuff, but he's been catching it back up. But in, in, this, in this type of situation, 
Like, you need the whole team to be eating. Like, the whole team be eating. And I think Doc Rivers, Doc Rivers need to get these, get their heads back together and lead this team into game seven. I can't even believe it. They're going game seven with the Denver Nuggets. And the Denver Nuggets, I big, I give big shout out to them because they some fighters. And ever since Jamal Murray, Nikola Jokic been in the playoffs, they played in every game seven in their playoff career. So they used to this situation. They're 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 used to the situation. And like you always say, the LA Clippers, they lose this, they lost some sleep the other night because they trying to figure out why they're still in this situation. We probably be preparing for the LA Lakers, but the Denver Nuggets is making a run and they trying to they trying to shock the world right now. Yeah, they are. And I've got to be honest, Clarence, yesterday, you know, we had NFL week one. So I'm watching my Packers dominate the Vikings in the second half on Fox yesterday, not even thinking about the NBA playoffs. I'm not even thinking about the NBA playoffs, bro. Like, I was watching football. I was in my football mode yesterday, and I completely forgot about the Denver Nuggets. I forgot about the Denver Nuggets. I I need to give an apology tonight on Wise Guys to Mike Malone and the Denver Nuggets. I completely underrated them, and I thought the Clippers were going to win this series in five games. Not only have they pushed this to a game seven, they have dominated the Clippers in the last two games, in games five and game six, in the second half. I'm watching football yesterday, and I'm and it, it was halftime of the Packers-Bikers game. So I'm feeling pretty good. Aaron Rodgers is putting on a great performance. I'm feeling pretty good, Clarence. I'm like, oh, man, we're about to get this win. Everything is great in Packer Nation right now. I turn to ESPN as I'm flipping through the channels, and the Nuggets have a double-digit lead on the Clippers in the second half. I'm like, what the hell is going on with the Clippers? So before I even get into the blame that I'm going to place on the Clippers' shoulders, I got to get some credit to Mike Malone and the Denver Nuggets. The Denver Nuggets, they are a resilient bunch, and they are trying to become the first team in NBA history to come back from a 3-1 deficit in the same postseason. We haven't seen anything like this before, Clarence. You remember in the first round, Donovan Mitchell, they had the Nuggets down three games to one, and the Nuggets pushed to to a game seven, and they won game seven. They won three straight games to win that series. And you can make a legitimate argument that the only reason the Clippers won game one of this series was because the Nuggets were still tired from their seven-game series previously with the Jazz. You see what I'm saying? Like, that was kind of more like a schedule loss. Like, the Clippers was already resting up. They was ready. But the Nuggets could have already won this series. But I got to give a lot of credit to Mike Malone and the Denver Nuggets as a team. Joker, yesterday he had 34 points, 13 of 22 shooting from the floor, four of six from three-point range. Nobody in the Clippers have an answer right now for the Joker. Nobody. Nobody can guard the Joker. They actually had the nerve yesterday to put Paul George on the Joker. He can't guard the Joker. Stop it. And he re- and he right now, he got Harold looking bad. Like Harold has no chance when he guarding the Joker. And then also, Jamal Murray, he had 21 points, shot nine of 13 from the floor. He's being more aggressive because if you remember, earlier in the series, he was inefficient. He wasn't shooting the ball well. But now Jamal Murray is in a rhythm and he's scoring the ball at a nice rate. Also, I got to give some credit to Porter Jr. Porter Jr. only had 13 points, but well, the junior possibly could be a future star in the NBA, Clarence, if he can stay healthy. And they get nice production also from Gary Harris. Gary Harris dropped 16 points yesterday for the Nuggets. So they're getting contributions all around their roster, and it's a balanced attack that they're putting towards the Clippers right now, and that got them in position to possibly advance to the Western Conference Finals. But let me get to the Clippers real quick before I get it back to you. The Clippers deserve more blame because – of how they lost these last two games. They had two double-digit leads in the second half of game five and game six. They had a 15-point second-half lead in game five. They had a 19-point second-half lead in game six. And they haven't been able to close the deal on the Nuggets. It seems like the Clippers are getting out to these big leads, and they kind of giving that impression to the Nuggets like, all right, are you done yet? Are you going to stop playing yet? Are you guys ready to start? Your vacation planning, are you ready to start one, two, three, Cancun? And every time the Nuggets fight back and they play well in the fourth quarters of the last two games. And one more thing I want to say. Clarence, Lou Williams 
He hasn't been the same since he left Magic City and returned back to the bubble. <laughs> he hasn't been the same. Like, I don't know what the hell happened when Lou Williams was in Atlanta at Magic City, but he hasn't been the same since he returned back to the bubble. Montrez Harrell, he hasn't played well either. And I think that's what the Clippers, they relied on that all season long. They relied on that bench production from Lou Williams and Montrez Harrell. They're not getting it right now. And I think that's part of the reason why they're struggling. And if they lose this series, it is going to be a bad look on Doc Rivers' coaching resume. Doc Rivers, he can't afford to lose this series because if he loses game seven, he will fall to 13 and 23 in closeout games all time. That is a bad look. And Balmer, the owner for the Clippers, he may look at Doc Rivers in a different light if they lose this series to seven games to the Denver Nuggets tomorrow night. So let me ask you this, like not ask you this, but Marcus Morris actually made a statement saying that the Clippers, they rely on being better on paper. So they're trying to follow what the paper said. Do you, like, I just want to ask you, do you, because you had them actually win in the final. Do you think yeah. they're, they're like, they get over their heads too much of like actually following the paper, what the paper's saying? Like, hey, this team look good on paper. So we need to look good in the NBA because we look good on paper. Do you think they like be overreacting or is over the head or something? No, I, I think defensively right now they are playing terrible. Let's call it what it is. Kawhi Leonard is a two-time defensive player of the year. Paul George was a candidate for defensive player of the year honors. Montrez Harrell is a defensive player. You know, you got Patrick Beverly, one of the best perimeter players in the NBA. Patrick Beverly yesterday, let me give you some of these numbers. He had two points. He fouled out in the game. He was awful. He, he should be ashamed to show his face in the city of Los Angeles if the Clippers lose game seven tomorrow night. Patrick Beverly should be ashamed to show his face. I don't want to hear no more trash talk from Patrick Beverly if the Lakers lose this. I mean, I'm sorry, if the Clippers lose this series. Patrick Bev need to shut the hell up. Shut the hell up, Patrick Bev, because you ain't played well so far in these playoffs. We got all these dogs supposedly on the Clippers team. Kawhi Leonard, Morris, Paul George, Patrick Beverly, you know, Montrez Harrell, Joe Kim Noah won a defensive player of the year at one point. All these dogs on their team, and they're giving up 64 points to the Denver Nuggets in the second half yesterday. 64. Let that sink in. What the hell was going on, Clippers? Y'all was my championship pick. Now I got to yeah. eat crow. I got to eat crow to Clarence because I said all year long, y'all was going to beat LeBron in the, in the Lakers in the Western Conference Finals, and y'all might not even get there. They might not get there. It's crazy, man. And one more thing. If the Clippers lose tomorrow night to the Nuggets, I don't want to hear no more Kawhi Leonard, the best player in the world, talk. I don't want to hear no more Kawhi Leonard in the best world talk. I don't want to hear no more of it because last year you can make a legitimate argument. Kawhi lucked up against the Golden State Warriors. You may disagree, but I think he would have lost if Kevin Durant and Klay Thompson didn't get injured. But even take Kevin Durant aside. If Clay Thompson didn't get injured in game six, I think the Toronto Raptors would have lost to the Warriors and the Splash Brothers in game seven in Toronto. So I think Kawhi Leonard needs to ball out in game seven and show why he is deserving to be in that best player in the world conversation. Because if not, it's going to be a bad look for the Clippers and Doc Rivers, man. Yeah, right there. Like, for, for this game seven, it's, it's important for Kawhi. because, And honestly, he's been in this situation before anyway when he was playing with the uh, – or Toronto Raptors, and he was in this situation game seven, I think, with the Philadelphia 76ers. And, you know, he, they had to put the ball in his hand for him to close the game out. So I think all the pressure is not on him. I think the pressure is on the Denver Nuggets because you're playing against a, a dominant player in Kawhi Leonard and a nice, nice, nice all superstar player in Paul George. So you got to come with your best game on that situation. So, yeah. Now, let me ask you a question before we move to the next topic. Who wins game seven? I still got the Clippers winning game seven, man. I think Kawhi, you can't bet against him in elimination games because he, he's, he's excelled in elimination games. And this is this is their time to actually come play basketball. Like, they, they need to come play basketball, Trey, to, like, come in tomorrow because the Denver Nuggets, they come in here, they they they, they was down 3-1 already in this playoff. So, yeah. they already got, like, they already got, like, grind and, like, miracle. And they, they already got, like, a lot of faith. They, they can win this game. So the Clippers, they got to be on the A game tomorrow. And Paul George, he need to go for 40 just to be on the safe side. But I got the Clippers in seven. I picked the Clippers to win the championship, and I also picked the Clippers to beat the Lakers in the Western Conference Finals to get to the finals. 
I'm not going to give on the, up up on the Clippers just yet, even though I am disappointed in the Clippers. I'm not going to give up on them just yet. I think the Clippers will win tomorrow night. I think Kawhi Leonard will prove why he is universally recognized as a top three player in the NBA. I think he's going to show why he is the best two-way player we have in the NBA. And he has to be the best player on the floor. The last two games in the second half, the best player on the floor has been the Joker. Tomorrow night in game seven, for the Clippers to win, they need Kawhi Leonard to be the best player on the court tomorrow night. It has to happen. But I will say this. Even though I think the Clippers are the favorites and they should win game seven tomorrow night, the Denver Nuggets clearance are playing with house money. They have nothing to lose, which means if we get to the fourth quarter and it's a close game, the pressure is going to be mounting against the Clippers. And you know it and I know it. The pressure is going to be mounting against this championship pick. Like, they have to rise above the pressure that comes tomorrow with tomorrow night. They got to play well tomorrow night, bro. Like, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be pressure tomorrow night if this game is close. Hopefully, the Clippers can get out to a 20-point lead and hold on to it this time. Because if they get to the fourth quarter and the Clippers are and the, and the Nuggets are fighting back, ain't no telling what could happen in the fourth quarter of a game seven. Yeah, this, this game seven is going to be very intense. Like, this game seven, Kawhi Leonard, he needs – it's time to show up. Like you said, you want to be you want to be the one of the – want to be rated as the top players in the world and in the NBA? This is the time for you to show up and close this game out and get ready for the next next round. Definitely. Um, let's move on, and let's talk about NFL Comeback Player of the Year. So we have our poll question that we've been asking everyone, give us our y'all vote. Who do you believe has the best chance to win NFL comeback player of the year? A, AJ Green, B, Cam Newton, C, Gronk, D, Big Ben. Question for our fans out there. Give us y'all answers. Let us know on the Wise Guys page. Give us y'all vote. We're going to talk about it here now, though. Clarence, who is your pick between these four choices to win NFL comeback player of the year? I think this this was a complicated answer question for me though, Trey, because like I, my 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 two my two uh, questions my two uh, multiple choices came down to which one is more hungrier. But if I had to choose, I'm picking B Cam Newton because but what Cam Newton did yesterday against the um, Miami Dolphins, he showed that hey, I'm still considered as an elite quarterback, and two rushing touchdowns was good, but the passing. The passer, it was decent, but it's going to get better over the time. And actually, their, their, his next game is in Seattle on a Sunday night football game. So we're going to see how he is on the road and how he, go, how he can um, definitely like definitely uh, preserve himself on, in this game. But if you have to ask who my vote is, it's B, it's B um, Cam Newton. What about yours? Well, for me, it was tough because I know over the last two years, A.J. Green – hasn't been healthy, and he has struggled to stay healthy for your Cincinnati Bengals overall. I believe in the early part of his career when he was healthy, I believe A.J. Green was a top five receiver in the NFL. Top three, honestly. Like, he was a baller for your Cincinnati Bengals. Like, I always made fun of Bengal fans and made fun of the Cincinnati Bengals as a team. I've always had the utmost respect for A.J. Green. Like, I always felt like A.J. Green, you know, is a top five receiver in the NFL when he's healthy. That's been the biggest issue with A.J. Green, though, these last two or three years. Can he stay healthy throughout the course of a 16-game season? I think A.J. Green's going to have a nice season, but I don't think he's going to be NFL Comeback Player of the Year. When it comes to Rob Gronkowski, I think Rob Gronkowski is going to have a nice season for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Tom Brady, but I think they have so many weapons in that offense that, that I think Gronk could get lost, you know, in the fold. You got Chris Godwin, a reliable second option at receiver. You got Mike Evans, an elite number one receiver in the NFL. You still got O.J. Howard, who's a nice tight end as well. And you got two nice running backs and Fournette, you know, and um, who am I missing? I'm missing somebody. Fournette and, oh, McCoy. McCoy. They got got the time McCoy. Yeah, yeah, Shady. So you got two running backs and those those two guys. So I think Rob Gronkowski could get lost in that mix of weapons that Tom Brady has at his disposal. I also look at Cam Newton with the New England Patriots. I like Cam Newton. And I told you I think Cam Newton is a dark horse 
for NFL MVP honors. I think yesterday he went like 15 of 19 passing. He had 155 passing yards, but he had two rushing touchdowns yesterday that were big time for the Patriots. And I think he played pretty well against the Miami Dolphins. 155 pass yards is not going to get it done, though. He has to do a better job moving forward of putting up better numbers from a passing perspective. But also, he doesn't really have elite weapons. I think Big Ben has a shot at winning NFL Comeback Player of the Year, but I also think he doesn't have an elite number one option at receiver. I think they're going to try to run the football this year with Connor and play great defense more so than put the game in Big Ben's hands to win. Therefore, I believe Cam Newton has the best chance to win NFL Comeback Player of the Year because I believe Cam Newton and his uh, his strengths is exactly what the Patriots need right now. I think the way the Patriots team is built, I think it's built for a quarterback like Cam Newton to lead it. Like, I don't think this team was built for Tom Brady last year. I think that's part of the reason why Tom Brady struggled in his last season with the Patriots. They aren't built for Tom Brady. They're more built for a Cam Newton and having a premier rush attack in the NFL. So I think Cam Newton has the best opportunity given the situation that he's in with the Patriots and Bill Belichick. So I like, I like, I like him to win NFL comeback player of the year. And I think Josh McDaniels and Bill Belichick are going to put together an offense based around Cam's strengths. And I think we're going to see the best from Cam Newton and he's going to definitely rejuvenate his career. It's definitely going to be dangerous though, but the schedule that he's coming across right there for Cam Newton is pretty tough. Like I was mentioning, he has a Sunday night football game this Sunday against the Seattle Seahawks. So you want to see what he's going to do on the road. And statistically, he's been better. He's, he's good playing against the Seahawks. Only lost one time in his career towards the Seahawks. So you want to see how he's going to preserve his preserve his uh his self for this game. So I'm looking. I'm definitely keeping Cam Newton on the radar. And it's, and I ain't gonna lie, it's very d- different that he's in the Patriots uniform. Yeah, it does look different. It does it does look different. Right now, though, Big Ben is playing well for the Steelers. He's 12 22 passing, 145 passing yards, two touchdowns. So Big Ben is off to a nice start trying to redeem himself from that injury that took place last season with the Steelers. But I think given the circumstances and given the situation, I think Cam Newton is going to be put in a situation to be successful more so than the rest of these players on this list. Well, Again, I'm not so sure of AJ Green can stay healthy for an entire 16-game season. I think Gronkowski is going to get overlooked with all those weapons that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have. And I think the Steelers want to run the football with James Conner this year and play elite defense. I don't think they want Big Ben to throw for over 300 passing yards and have four touchdowns like they did in previous years when they had Le'Veon Bell and Antonio Brown. He's doing good right now. He got two touchdown passes. He's doing good right now. But I just don't – I just think Mike Tomlin wants to run the football. I think they want to get back to running the football, and I think that's what it's going to take for the Steelers to be possibly Super Bowl contenders. I don't think Big Ben throwing the ball over 300 yards is going to help the Steelers get back to being in contention for a Super Bowl. So I just think given all of the circumstances around these four players, I think Cam Newton has the best opportunity to win NFL Comeback Player of the Year, given the position that Josh McDaniels and Bill Belichick will put him in. Definitely, definitely. But Big Ben is somebody to watch, too, because he's come back from injury, and they want him at his 2018 farm. So it's going to be very interesting who's going to be the NFL Comeback Player of the Year. For sure. Everybody remember, go and follow Wise Guys on Twitter at WiseGuys underscore awaits. Also on Facebook, Wise Guys. And be sure to follow Wise Guys on Instagram with these guys, no sports. Clarence, tomorrow we can go, let me go on live and we're going to preview the Eastern Conference Finals. We'll do that. Oh. We'll do that tomorrow because we got game one between the Miami Heat and the Boston Celtics tomorrow night. We'll go on live tomorrow and preview that series. So fans, be on the lookout for us going live tomorrow night. Clarence, you got any big plans tonight, bro? Uh, I'm actually tuned in. I'm actually tuned in to that Monday Night Football game. I wanted to ask who, who's got winning. Who's got winning tonight? Titans or Broncos? Quick, 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 I'm a roll. I'm a I'm a roll with the Titans, but I think it will be a close matchup because I think the Denver Broncos are a much improved football team. I know they lost Von Miller to a season-ending injury, which isn't good, but I think they're a much improved team, and I think it's going to be a competitive game given the fact that these two teams compete. You know, in the AF, in the AFC West, so it's gonna be a it's gonna be a competitive game, 
But I think uh, I'm sorry, not the AFC West because the tight. I'm tripping. The Titans is in the South, and the Buck and the Broncos in the West. But I think it'd be a competitive game. I think the Titans going to ride Derrick Henry to a victory tonight. So I got the Titans winning a close one. I'm pulling the upset. I'm definitely taking the Broncos. I like how they're built around um, Drew Lock, and I'm, I'm excited. Jerry going to be on tonight. He said, unfortunately, Cortland Sutton is, is injury. So it's, I'm definitely looking forward to what he's going to be on tonight. Right. I'll see you on Wednesday night, bro. Everybody have a great night. It is the Worldwide Sports Radio Network.